not recording when I press it. There you go. There we go. Okay, Alex, I was going to introduce you. Yeah. That's all right. Not that you need an introduction, but there might be people here that don't know about you. So, uh, so first, welcome everybody to this sort of new uh, reformulation of the National Research Platform Engagement Meeting Series. So, the idea is to have um, speakers and focused discussions on a variety of topics. So, if you have suggestions, go ahead and just send me a note. Um, and today we have Dr. Alex Feltis. And just because we're trying to be good about this, I'm going to give you his full introduction. So Dr. Feltis received his Bachelor's of Science in Biochemistry from Auburn University in 92. He served for two years in the Peace Corps and then completed his advanced training in biomedical sciences at Vanderbilt and Emory. Since 2002, he's performed research in bioinformatics, high performance computing, cyber infrastructure, network biology, genome assembly, system genetics, paleogenomics, and bioenergy feedstock genetics. So a real boundary spanner there, Alex. Um, currently, he's a professor in Clemson University's Department of Genetics and Biochemistry, CEO of Allele Systems LLC core facility in the, let's see, CUMUSC Biomedical Data Science and Informatics Program, member of the Center for Human Genetics, and serves on the Internet to Board of Trustees, as well as various advanced research computing engagement work groups, for which I particularly am thankful. Um, Alex has published numerous scientific articles in peer-reviewed journals, teaches undergrad and PhD students in bioinformatics, biochemistry, and genetics, at present, he is funded by multiple NSF grants and is engaged in tethering together extremely smart people from diverse technical backgrounds in an effort to propel genomics from research from, and get this, Excel scale towards the exascale. So thank you, Alex, for coming today, and I'm going to um, turn it over to you. Thanks. Yeah, that joke at the end really is, um, is a serious thing. Like most all, all good science is done in Excel and I think even better science can be done outside of Excel because it's almost impossible now to do it high end science in, in Excel, but Excel is still awesome. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so uh, what I want to talk about today is um, I'm, an, I'm a, a sort of a, I mean, I have a lab with a lot of really smart people who are doing a lot of the work and the engineering and running workflows on things like the PRP cluster. And this is my like kind of new, noobish, um, uh, attempt to, to show you how, how we're doing it because I don't do it every day, right? So uh, I'll show you um, some cutting and pasting of some some command lines and, and let you know what we're trying to do with this, but also put a little background into what we're doing from a genomics perspective. Um, so and I, like I said, this uh, Dana asked me earlier, if anybody has questions, just stop me. Dana, if you can do that and I'll, I'll be happy to answer along, along the way. So what I'll do is I'll just get a little intro and we're trying to do and then go straight into a, a demo with a PRP. Um, and as time permits, I'll have these other topics like going into some more of our workflows, which a lot of these workflows I think are, um, are useful for a lot of people doing genomics. It doesn't even matter if they're doing plant or animal genomics um, and they're, they're working on, on uh, Kubernetes clusters. So I wanna point those out to you, uh, but also, and then talk a little bit about how I see how we could build out Nautilus um, and then uh, bleb off from Nautilus, make a giant amoeba and split the amoeba into two and grow the amoebas and keep growing a national research platform. And the last, last thing I'll do, which I, I doubt a lot of time, is just talk about some biomarker discoveries we're doing for, uh, for cancer. So my lab is, um, I was trained as a biomedical um, scientist. I wanted to cure cancer, still do. And, um, but I went into the light side for a long time and worked in, in, the, in the plant kingdom. So my lab right now is about, from a biology perspective, we do about half, half of its plants, half of its animals. Um, but also we do a lot of, um, to be able to do a lot of the work we do, we have to develop bioinformatics um, software and also develop cyber infrastructure um, products to be able to do a lot of what we're trying to do. My, my big thing is trying to um, be able to have the, in, into the hands of anybody, the data and the com computational platforms and workflows to do high-end science. I, I, my dream is to get the board kid in the back of the high school classroom um, who's like you know, looking at Facebook, having them try to analyze some cancer genome atlas data sets on things like the PRP instead of, you know, let, let him go to the, the, the principal's office for doing that as opposed to doing something else. 
So my lab, a big part of it is we're trying to uh, move away from uh, a reductionist approach to science and move to work towards more of a holistic approach. As things get more complex, we get more frustrated, but also more happy at the same time because we're getting close to, closer to reality. Um, and this is just a picture showing this uh, thing going. Uh, this is a, an experiment I did in, in grad school at Northern Blot, where this is looking at 12 different samples under four different conditions. And I used to get real frustrated doing this kind of work because I wanted to have, I wanted to see the real complexity of the system. This is a, a recent paper we had where we're looking at over 2,000 tumor samples plus some normal samples under eight, eight different conditions, five different cancer types, and five, uh, four, uh, four different cancer, five different cancer types, five different normal conditions, actually should be 10. Uh, but anyway, look at these, where these dots here are gene expression patterns. Each row is a gene, each column is a tumor or a matched normal sample. Red means high, green means low. And so this is just a, a giant you know, expression matrix of these different conditions. And we go through and look for correlations of the data and build these networks out, which I'll show you an example of this um, running on the PRP in a second. This is where we do our compute. Um, we have a really nice democratized condominium style cluster here, um, the Clemson Palmetto cluster, um, which is it's actually the teraflops here is low. I didn't get the latest number, but this is, you know, we have over 2000 uh, cores or 2000 nodes, excuse me. Um, this is a great system, it's democratized. I love uh, at Clemson, I can have a freshman come into my class and I can get them account on the cluster and they can start doing stuff on, on a cluster, which is great. Um, we also use the open science grid a lot. Um, we've used it, we almost had a tremendous amount of, of usage actually in the last few years. Um, in the last couple of years since the PRP Nautilus cluster came online, we've been using that to do a lot of work. And I'm very interested in scaling this out because I think these classical systems, which are awesome, we need to be able to really expand out um, into the cloud. And so we're, we're I wanna use, we're using the PRP cluster to get work done, but also to test workflows. Um, that function on a Kubernetes cluster. And once we have those functional, um, we'll, we're able to port them out into things like Google Cloud, we've been using a lot. We've been working with Cisco on their C CCP platform. And we have a CC Star project, which we call SIDOS, where we have a, 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 a entry point into the cloud to be able to run the same workflows. So I'm looking at all these cloud-based systems. To me, they're Kubernetes-based systems that if we have you know, something functional that runs on these systems, um, they'll run on any of them. And also the workflows, they're containerized and they'll run on, on these systems as well. The cloud is scale up to me. So a big part of what we're trying to do is um, uh, find or, uh, interactions and correlations between genes. Like in the human genome, there's 60,000 genes and each one of them can make multiple products. And we're trying to understand how they're interacting. Um, in the human genome, we're also looking at uh, plants like the legume, plant, metacago, and trying to understand the processes there. But basically what we're do, we do with uh, um, to find gene interactions is we just look for correlations. So like a Pearson or Spearman's correlation, if you are familiar with those, where we look for genes like gene A and B always tend to rise and fall under different conditions and C doesn't rise and fall. So if you look at this on a scatter plot, you see there's a linear relationship between A and B across conditions, but not between A and C and B and C. So we can make a graph of these where A and B are related to each other through co-expression. We draw an edge in the graph, C's there, but it's not connected to anybody. And this is called a gene co-expression expression graph. And so again, like, you know, humans, we actually, there's over 200, about 210,000 um, gene products, RNA molecules that you can look for these kind of correlations in now under different contexts. Um, so we, we are a little more sophisticated in this looking for correlation. We correlations in all samples. We actually now have algorithms, which I'll show you one in just a second for the demo, um, where we can find edges, relationships between say gene A and gene B. And this is just showing you this as on this axis, this gene B is more highly expressed. This gene A is more highly expressed on this axis. And we go through, we find modes in the data. We use Gaussian mixture models to do this, um, which is encoded in a Kubernetes enabled um, algorithm. Um, but this is showing there's two different modes of, in the data here. And so we can actually do like circumscribe these and do two correlation tests, basically. Um, there's billions of correlations if you're starting to study, you know, 50,000 genes at the same time. So it's very computationally intensive. But the idea here is to say under these samples, which each dot is a sample, there's a relationship between gene A and B, B, gene B that you don't see in these samples. And then you go through and say like, hey, are these, you know, a particular type of tumor or normal or something like that. Um, so this would be an edge here between A and B, but only under these different conditions. 
Um, we've, uh, just to give you one, one example of this, then I'll go into the demo, is that we've taken, um, uh, there's a, a database called GTEx, which is normal human tissue for, from donors. Um, a lot of these people are deceased, of course, um, but so it's not completely normal, but there's a, it's a very nice baseline data set for gene expression. Um, in normal situations, you can then say, hey, are these gene expressions different in, say, tumors or some aberrant condition? But this is 13 different brain tissues here, and these are the expression patterns. Um, of this. this is a T-SNE plot just showing you the relationships between the, the expression dimensions, um, and these are the different tissue types here. And we've gone through and built condition-specific gene co-expression network graphs, like I was just showing you, where we could actually go through and pull out particular parts of the brain and be able to use those, again, as a T-SNE plot to find out how they distinguish uh, normal tissues. So we can find out, you know, if Gene or genes are being related to each other in a normal context, like a cortex of the brain versus say an abnormal context like glioblastoma or something like that. So to make these networks, um, this is the algorithm that we've developed. This is with Stephen Ficklin's lab at Washington State University. He's an awesome collaborator. Um, this is called Kink Knowledge Independent Network Instruction. Um, and this is a way to find these relationships without knowing what the relationships are. We're using statistics to find them but then going and putting them into a, a context of normal versus aberrant, say, different uh, types of conditions. Um, this is the, uh, the, the GitHub repo for the, the algorithm here, the, the binary. This is um, a Nextflow-enabled uh, version of Kink. Nextflow is a workflow manager, which I'll talk about later if we have time. Um, and then we also have these um, uh, helper scripts to run, be able to run on Kubernetes systems. So there's instructions here to run this Nextflow workflow um, with, with kink um, on, on a Kubernetes-based systems. So what I'll do here is to, to go onto Nautilus and do a demo. We're finding these um, gene co-expression network gene uh, GCN edges um, using a test set um, from yeast. So this is like yeast that you use to make bread and beer, um, the expression patterns um, in there, and uh, de detecting interactions between them. And I'll use the Nautilus cluster to be able to do this. If there's any questions, um, please, uh, this is a good time to be asking them because I'm going to be moving through uh, doing this. Thanks, Alex. There's one from earlier. Is GBM glioblastoma? Yes. Yes, it is. We've done quite a bit of work with glioblastoma. Yeah. And then we the other the one, so you mentioned the, the Gaussian mixture model. Are those libraries that you just call or are you all having yep. to write we, your own? We call yeah. the libraries, yeah. Okay. That's actually, there's usually when you're, we're pulling a library like that and there's usually some issues with it from performance or it doesn't always give you the same results as other libraries. So there's a lot of work that goes into choosing those libraries. Oh, yeah. All right, so what I'm going to do here, again, um, you know, this, like I, I know what I'm doing, but I'm also a noob <laughs> with this. So let's, let's see what happens. But I'm going to go and um, pull, do everything from scratch. Um, I'm on a VM on my laptop right now, and I want to be able to um, grab, I'm going to clone a repo here that has the, um, this kink workflow in it. Uh, but it also has um, a data set in it, this yeast data set. And I want to show you this. And so all this is, is um, it's a, a bunch of floating point values. It's a N by M matrix where each, each column is a, a sample, a yeast experiment, where it could have, there's different types of uh, treatments have done the yeast, and each row is, is a gene ID. And I forget, there's, there's several thousand genes in here. So I have this on my um, computer, this input directory, and a lot of the scripts I need, but I'm gonna actually use, I'm using my laptop as a way to upload this data set that I need to onto the PRP. So I'm gonna use um, this, uh, command here. Actually, let me, let me actually, I'm going to actually log in, get a pod going and log into the cluster so we can see what's going on. Oh, that's not going to work. We'll do this right. Yes, that's correct. Sorry.
so this is launching a pod now where we, we can actually go and look into our, our, um, our namespace. Uh, the way PRP works, I'm not so sure who's on the call with this, um, but this dgtext-prp, this is our namespace my group uses. And it's also, um, it's a great namespace that I've added, added collaborators to, um, lots of collaborators actually to this. But this is a place where we have a persistent storage, persistent volume claim, and we can run store data on here. And so right now, um, there's, I have a successful run here in case the demo goes south, but um, this is, there's nothing here. And I can actually upload that data set now, that entire input directory. Um, with this cube, cube load script that we have. And this is copying that input directory, hopefully over to, um, to the uh, namespace. And so we have, I'll show you these a little bit later, we have some of these scripts to help us be able to you know, move data um, back and forth um, between between the um, the namespace. So that actually should be done. So there's the input directory. It's now been copied over into the pod. So to run the workflow, I don't know why I keep clicking that. Um, so I'll talk about this again in a second, but um, we're actually going to uh, run this use kube run to run the workflow that we've pulled. We've got in re uh, into Git from GitHub. We can pull it. Every, all, everything's been container containerized. We use our um, namespace to be able to run the job, and we're using this the Nextflow workflow manager to to run a lot of our our our, um, our workflows, which I'll I'll talk about hopefully after the, the demo works flawlessly. But the data is there. So I had to copy that from a local system. And so now this should be pulling in um, the workflow from, from, the, from GitHub, pulling in the containers and running them on that data in the input directory. Um, there, I won't go into this, but with the, there's, in the workflow, there's a lot, you can change parameters, like you know, how many, uh, this actually will take our, our data set all the combinations of correlations. It'll chunk them up into embarrassingly parallel chunks. Um, I think it'll do 10. Um, and then go run run 10, you know, 10 embarrassingly parallel jobs and then merge the, the data back together at the end. So this is a small data set, but if you have larger ones, you can adjust the number of chunks and you can use GPUs or not and adjust resources and things like that. But these few commands that I'm doing, um, if everything's working, uh, properly. Uh, yeah, I can see it running like 10 pods now at a time. I actually never saw it working. This is great. <laughs> These are new new errors here. I'm not sure what this is, but we'll see what happens. Oh, they're starting. And with, with Nexo 2, if everything is functional, it, it does a pretty good job restarting jobs. So we have that layer of, of security um, built in. Um, are there any questions right now? This might, if this goes fast, we might be able to watch the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, we got one. Um, do you see managing the workflow with Nextflow as easier than managing YAML files to orchestrate the workflow? Um, yeah, this is this is this is wor it's working for us. I'm not sure to answer that question. I mean, so Nextflow is a lot, uh, giving us a lot of the functionality we need. Um, so it's it's definitely uh, a good place to be launching jobs from. We could do it other ways, but this, this seems to be working pretty well. So let me, uh, let me let this go. If anybody has more questions, I can answer them, but I'll let this run for a little bit and just go through a few other things um, that I had here. So I'd like to pose a question if I could. Yep. Yeah, hi, this is Jim Kirianis from Nizernet. Um, so did you have pre-existing software and tools that you had to adapt to run within uh, Kubernetes containers, the PRP environment? And if you did, how arduous was it? Was it straightforward or is it um, kind of getting at, what does it take for a researcher to start using the environment from a coding perspective and how uphill of a climb is it to get their code running in the PRP? So that's an excellent question. Um, so 
we these all these uh, I think well at least definitely a kink that I'm showing you here and some of other applications we we were used on our campus cluster right that's a torque based cluster mm -hmm. um, and we modified that some of those we modified for the open science grid so we adapted to HT Condor based systems and now we're adapting them to this and so it's very difficult to do this um, the learning curve is gets you know and once you ride the learning curve on how to do this it's easier for other workflows to be adapted to to Kubernetes say. But um, once it's working, it's functional, I'm, I'm gonna like paste a few lines of code, learn how to change a config file, then it should be easy for the user to, to do this. So we're, we're trying to pull out that um, arduousness of it and put it into a GitHub, right? So people can do that. If it's a brand new workflow and you haven't done this before, it would definitely be a, a difficult thing to do. But so was getting on OSG and quite frankly, the first time I launched jobs on the campus cluster was not trivial, right? a few years ago to be able to do that. So the idea is we're trying to, I want to be able to abstract everything, have it robustly work on Kubernetes systems because we can scale out to the cloud and then have the user worry about changing config files and sw swapping out data. Okay, that thank you. Okay. Yeah. So this is do still- Do you think still, that this is maybe, do you think this is maybe a space where some additional documentation and YouTube videos and how to's might help. Yeah, and so we're trying to put that documentation in, in our, our repos. And but having like a how to run stuff on Kubernetes, like layers of documentation, that would be great. And, and I think a lot of us could probably develop some of that, right? Mm -hmm. And like, don't, just don't be afraid, give it a shot, right? Always helps too. So while that's running, um, is this still, can you still see this okay? I'm, I'm not going to put it in presentation mode. Yeah, we see it in the PowerPoint screen, but sure. Okay. While this is running, I just want to put a, a few things there. So the reason why I'm doing this is not, I mean, I'm a geek, so I like this, but also the da data sets are getting huge. Um, this is one one repo, um, the NCBI SRA archive, which has modern sequencing data in it. There are trillions and trillions of sequences in these experiments, almost over 5 million now. Experiments have been done for different organisms that can be downloaded and reanalyzed. And this is, we, we kind of, this is sort of the bread and butter of the lab. Um, this is, an, a, this is a, a scaled uh, growth curve here. There's 31 petabytes in the last 10 years um, in this one database. This is internet two traffic that's over an exabyte, right, of traffic in a year. So these are not just genomics, it's all sorts of different disciplines. I'm sure lots of people on the call know this, you know, but genomics is one of the worst ones because you can have almost an infinite number of combinations of things and um, in a reasonable grant, you could generate a lot of data to be able to process. There's massive data sets like um, the Cancer Genome Atlas. Um, it's uh, over 6,000, 6,600 papers have been published on this alone. Um, this has 33,000 different tumors and normal, normal samples in it. Um, great way to, you know, place to figure out how to cure cancer for the faculty person in South Carolina or the high school student um, sitting somewhere with nothing to do give them access to the data. This is the GTEx project. That's almost a thousand people, over 11,000 samples of human, normal human tissue. That's all de-identified in public if you're looking at the RNA expression levels. Um, the stuff that I'm running right now, you can just access it and use it. Um, we're doing a lot of data with Spark, Spark Data, which has a lot of um, uh, families with, where one of the family members has, is affected with autism spectrum disorder. And we're trying to mine through that data set. And this is secure data we actually have running on our campus cluster that I would love to port over into the cloud or PRP um, down, down the road. Um, we also generate our lab. Uh, we're working on understanding our roots um, recruit bacteria into their um, into the roots and fix nitrogen from the air, make their own fertilizer. And we're also working with some people who've been growing um, some Arabidopsis plants, these little guys on the space station and trying to understand the effects of gravity and light on uh, of, you know, on a, a model plant, but also for food production down the road. Let's take a peek at this, still running. Um, and so um, I just wanted to go, go through this too a little bit like about um, what is what is all this genomics data? Because I know like I, I, I take for granted that, uh, that I know what TCJ is, but not everybody knows what all that stuff is, right? Um, and just to back up a little bit, so these massive data sets that you can use to understand biological systems that I just mentioned, uh, but just to give you an idea of what these things are. So like if you take a book, right, like here's the Bible, um, 774,000 words, 26 letter alphabet, 
that you could go through a, you know, a sentence in the English language and you could change one letter, say from S-O-N to S-U-N here, and you know, they're, they're gonna send you back to summer school uh, for, the, for uh, us uh, to learn, learn more about what's going on. They're gonna get kicked out of church. Um, that joke didn't go over very well. Uh, but this is a genomics data, right? So this is the karyotype. This is, are your chromosomes where you have chromosome one to 22 plus X, 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 Y. So 23 pairs, 23 and me. Um, chromosomes one is chromosome one's bigger than chromosome 22. Um, but if you change one letter in chromosome uh, for 17 um, from this T to a G, then that one letter change out of 3 billion letters can give you a higher risk for breast and ovarian cancer. And so this is a four letter alphabet with 60,000 words. This is a 26 letter alphabet with 775,000 words. So the way you get data from uh, the genome is you take a DNA, this is the double helix here, and you read the double helix with these proteins. They grab onto the double helix, open it up and read it and make RNA from it. So they can transduce the information here to RNA, which can then go and be made into protein. Um, this can give you, um, after all this is done, you can get an animal, right? You can transform this information locked into the chromosome into an animal. Um, just like with a Blu-ray disc, you can go through and scan it with a laser and be able to pull off data and transform it into say a movie, right? It's very, very similar situations here. Um, the way DNA works is great because it's, it's perfect for computers um, to be able to analyze the four-letter alphabet and try to extract out information from that. Hence why we have bioinformatics. Um, here's another example of uh, DNA changes. So if you have this uh, DNA pattern here from on your two chromosomes, if you have an A and an A here, then you'll metabolize caffeine really quickly. If you have this other genotype, this other pattern of, of uh, TGs and Cs here, um, then you'll, you will not process caffeine very quickly. And so you actually have, can have caffeine. You need less caffeine to be able to give you um, energy, um, if that's the right word for it. Um, but these are, these are, this is actually from a 23andMe um, test, right? They test for your ability of one particular enzyme to process um, caffeine and other, other drugs, which is really important for understanding, like if you need to be dosed with a certain amount of drug, don't overdose somebody or underdose somebody, give them what they need based upon their, their gen genotype. And let me pause here, still running. Does anybody have any questions before I, I keep get going on? Are we good? Well, if you want to answer some more, this is kind of off topic. It's back to Jimmy's question about the tutorials for you know domain scientists. Any idea how much, you know, like all the tutorials you're building for people and your students, how much is translatable to other disciplines or do you think they're mostly just applicable to other bioinformatics workflows? I think like when you get to the, from what we're doing, um, up to the next, how to containerize something up to the mm -hmm. next full level, we could teach those or those, you know, those could, would, could impact anybody using those, those levels. But after that, you get pretty specific with the algorithm. Mm -hmm. and the data, right? Which I'll actually show you a little bit of the data formats here. Cool. Up to a point. And what, what, I, what I'm doing, actually I'm gonna, in the spring I'm not teaching, I'm gonna go to some schools, and I'm gonna teach these workflows. I'm gonna start off with software carpentry type stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Like being able to use Linux and being able to, you know, do, use the command line to be able to paste these commands, right? At the very least. Um, but training is doesn't, this it is required for this to get people to actually use it and fail and show them why they failed. It's very important for that. This is more of a laboratory type training thing, I think, than just documentation, except for like the sophisticated people on this call. Lots of people would probably go through that documentation and be fine. Right. Yeah. The software carpentry model is 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 great. Yep. It's excellent. Yeah, and I, down the road, I would like to help, you know, have a, a Kubernetes carpentry module, right? At least help contribute to something like that. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. It's that it's in the work. It's that actually happening. It's not just an idea. Cool. Um, any other questions? I don't see any in the chat at the moment. So um, I know there's probably a lot of like uh, uh, computer science -y type people on the call. I just want to jump into the data format a little bit. Um, it's that's that's because uh, it's a fundamental data type for a lot of genomics. That you know you go through and you get things like that those caffeine metabolizing loci and breast cancer risk vector genes and stuff like that. 
all that information comes from sequencing somebody's DNA or their RNA. And so modern sequencers, sequencers can sequence just tons and tons, millions and millions of molecules where you can actually go get a, a little piece of a molecule like shown here. This is a, a record from what's called a FASTQ file. And then you can align that substring to a larger string, your chromosome. And there's 24 chromosomes, 24 strings in humans, uh, reference chromosomes. And you can find out where you are in that chromosome and say, hey, I, I hit that gene. That gene was expressed. And you can just count how many times you see genes expressed based upon where the string aligns. And so I just want to point out, this is one record for fast, a FASTQ file where you have a, a header line, sequence, another header. And then this is a, um, a quality score. Like what's the probability of that being a G, that being a G, that being a T, et cetera. And this is just using the ASCII table, using the decimal values plus a little um, subtraction from the decimal value to be able to give you a probability of what these base calls are. So this is a way to encode, you know, if there's errors in the sequencer, um, you might be able, you can have software go and strip those, those bad errors out, those bad sequences. Um, so there's a, a file typically is um, four, four lines per record, and you might have 20 million, 200 million records in a particular file. It's typically naked te uh, ASCII text, so you can just see it. I can never stress enough to people that bioinformatics software is usually poorly, poorly done. It's poor, usually bad formats and uh, can be much more efficient. Once you have DNA sequences, and this is how I got those gene expression values that we're using for yeast, is you go through and you might have, you know, a 20 million sequences or whatever, um, and go through, these are the lengths of the different chromosomes. So the string for chromosomes one is 240 million base pairs. For chromosome Y, 59 million base pairs. It's a little nub of a chromosome, sorry guys. Um, but these are the different strings that you align your 20 million reads to, right? So it's computationally intensive to be able to do these alignments over and over again. Um, and just here's a little bit of pseudocode just showing you how to do that alignment. So like, you know, if I have say 200 million reads that I say took out of a, um, say a, a breast tumor, right? We sequenced the breast tumor, put it, chopped it up, purified the RNA and turned it into DNA and sequenced it. That this, this one read right here hit chromosome 17 at one particular position. And so that would be like this gene mapped to this bra the BRCA1, that's a, a breast cancer susceptibility gene a lot of people have heard of, that we've counted this gene one time. And then we go to two out of 200 million, three out of 200 million. And a lot of times we'll hit this gene more than one time, right? And be able to quantify uh, gene expression. So this is the output of this. This is exactly what I just put into that kink workflow on PRP, where these are um, uh, different columns here are different samples and different rows are different genes. And these just numbers here are, are like not pre-processed yet, not normalized or anything, just raw counts that this gene right here was hit, it was found eight over 18,000 times. This gene here was found nine. So it just gives you a relative amount of gene expression for genes in organisms. And let's peek at this again. Ah, it's almost done, awesome. If it actually works, if, I think it might be my first demo to actually work all the way through. So I just ruined, I just totally jinxed it. But anyway, so this is a fundamental data type here of gene expression. And this is used by anybody who's doing uh, genomics. This is the, the, if you're trying to understand gene expression, this is what you do is make this thing. So if you have workflows that can process this gem, gene expression matrix, it's useful for a lot of people. So we've been focusing a lot of attention um, getting this thing working on different systems so that we can, you know, it's, it's, it's available now, but so people can go and pull data and, and process it. Um, we've actually used, built a, work, a workflow called GemMaker. Here's the re repo um, here, where this is using all these, this application chain to be able to go from raw FASTQ files to, um, to the gene expression matrix. And we've actually got this to work, uh, got this to work at a 22,000 sample scale. Um, so we're, this is like, you know, petascale with intermediate files and stuff. Um, and we're trying to make that really robust and finding all sorts of um, data intensive computing issues um, when we do that. But this is sort of like a fundamental workflow that if anybody on this call is working with genomicists, like this might, you know, selling this, this might be something that they could, they could use. Um, this is uh, just a little map of part of the uh, workflows in, in my lab. This is that gene expression matrix right here. And we use this to go and do lots of different downstream things. Um, but this is sort of that GemMaker workflow is sort of like, you know, FASTQ, this part right here, FASTQ to BAM files, if, if anybody's familiar with that. 
Um, we're pulling data from Republic repositories plus our own local data, and we're putting into an IRODS data grid that we have. Uh, but also we're, we're working with some information centric networking uh, uh, systems to be able to put the data out there and pull these data into our workflows and be able to, to process them. And so all this stuff we have um, you know, to do these workflows, it's all containerized and we either have them working on OST through with Pegasus workflow managers or Nextflow workflow we're using. We also have versions of that as well. And everything's been really dockerized. So one more question if I could. So yeah, so you mentioned OSG, you mentioned running on Condor. Where do you think the P running within containers and on the PRP is advantageous? Is that, so for a researcher who might be on OSG today or maybe doesn't have containerized cord, uh, code, what would, what would be the benefits of running within a containerized and PRP environment? Where do you think the value is and it's helped you out that pro yeah, perhaps an OSG you we're doing as well. Um, the ex excellent question. So my 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 advice to somebody that would be is if it's working, don't don't stop, <laughs> right? But so we're we're having scale up problems, and I think a lot more people are going to have scale up problems. And OSG is awesome. It's allowed us to scale up beyond my wildest dreams, but I'm trying to go beyond my wildest dreams now. If that's right, um, because we need to go out in the cloud, and so I need to be able to do massive workflows, say in GCP. And so to me, what something like PRP is is a place to do work, but it's also a test bed to get my workflows functional. So then I can go in, on the cloud and have functional workflows and not be burning up credits trying to make my workflows functional, essentially. So to me, it's like, I don't, I don't think, and this is me getting probably maybe too opinionated for such a call, but I don't think we can survive um, d doing genomics and other disciplines without massive move, movement to the cloud, right? I just don't think we can do that locally or through OSG. But definitely, at least from a bursting perspective alone, being able to burst the cloud is huge. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. And I, I make it clear it's the, 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 if I say anything controversial, I love my campus cluster. I love OSG. I love Kubernetes. I love it all. It's just that I think Kubernetes is a place where there's some symmetry that you know you can use to, to scale up. So are you thinking that you would have code that would run in PRP and can burst into the cloud as well? Yes, yeah, so we're doing that. So we're we're doing with on GCP and we're, these are, we have these things are running up on both systems now. Yeah. So um, it looks so like the workflow. And, and, sorry, so you're doing PRP and Google as well. Yeah, so we've run some jobs on Amazon, but we're more routinely doing stuff right now on, on Google. Google's been awesome, giving us credits to test things out in in PRP. All right, thanks. Um, Anyway, so this this just worked. Um, it it created a so this yeast co-expression network. Um, so this is just an edge list here, where this is node A, this is node node B. There's a significant correlation value, and there's there's a bunch of other stuff in here. This you know this esoterica is specific to this this workflow, um, but this was functional, and I can pull data now from the PRP. So we were saying this this script knows to go to our namespace and pull that output directory essentially. And it should should be local. Um, I mean, it looks like it's going to work. Let's actually prove it to you. I have a, a local copy here. Let me just show you what this is. So this, all that did was go through and look through all the possible gene expression values, find significant correlations, and let's see, here it is. Um, this is a program called Cytoscape, which allows you to view graphs of things, right? It's been around for since the 90s. It's a great thing. Um, but this is the co-expression network where each one of these nodes is a gene. Um, here. And so we can go through and analyze and say, hey, look, this package of genes 
is yeast, are these important for fermentation, or are these important for reproduction of the yeast, and try to understand what these packages of genes mean and, and uh, address complexity issues. And so this output directory here, this is it. So this has been pulled from, from the, uh, the PRP onto my, my laptop, and so I can do stuff with it. So that, that was the sort of the demo um, for that. Any, any questions about the, the demo? I just want to say I'm impressed you pulled off a dev live demo. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's, my problem is I always wanted to make sure this it's real. I don't want to do a video and stuff because yeah. I'd rather you see a break and live than something that's fake. Right. So it, this does work. There's 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 robustness issues, of course, with this. Um, but but overall, it seems to be pretty pretty robust. Um, but we still have tweaks we're doing at the workflow level and and with PRP. Yeah, we see your presenter mode now. Yeah. Let me. Um, can you see this? There you go. Is good. So again, just, just uh, I want to get to one thing since before time runs out um, to bring it up. But these are our workflows, right? This is the gene expression matrix as I was showing you. And some of the downstream you know, workflows are here. There's gene co-expression analysis. That's kink. That's what we just did. Um, we have some machine learning algorithms that work great on PRP because of the, the GPUs um, that are out there, um, some other uh, workflows that we do. This is that uh, machine learning algorithm to go and classify. You give it a list of genes. And it, It'll, it'll go through and find out if the list of genes are really good at classifying different conditions um, that we have you know, working for Kubernetes. We have instructions for this. You know, the instructions are a bit raw. We're still getting things to work, and we'll, we'll improve them over, over time. Um, but this is um, sort of, I guess, the, a summary slide for this. So we have uh, wrapped everything in NextFlow. You know, there's the user with laptop here, right? And this is uh, being able to pull data on the PVC. This is using the PRP for processing. Um, we're pulling in data. This actually is not just NDM, but other, other ways to pull data into it. Actually pulled in you know, from my laptop into the data transfer pod here. Um, this is the, the workflows, kink NF. For NF stands for next flow. That's the workflow I just ran. GemMaker is that one that I think is really uh, very useful for lots of people. It'll actually pull data in from NCBI and their format converts the right formats and be able to process data at scale. This is that gene oracle algorithm. Um, we have some uh, uh, scripts to help you know, copying and paste, uh, pulling and pushing data into um, uh, into the, the namespace. Um, we have a next, Nextflow API that we're using uh, to be able to call things we're doing this for our side project. Um, and these are some of the, the Kubernetes platforms that we're using, right? Um, we're doing also doing some work with Cisco with their CCP platform um, and the Slate project. Uh, we're doing some work on that too as well. And what's cool is that we, you know, we're messing around with Kubernetes workflows well, these are all Kubernetes clusters, and so we can we can try it on things that would be more difficult if they weren't like have based on the same system. Um, and so I think um, I'd like to spend the last little bit of time just uh, throwing these things up there and, and be happy to have a discussion about this. And so wh why? How do we scale the PRP cluster, and why? And this is um, uh, this is my opinion on this matter, not anybody else's opinion. But um, the computing is getting bigger and bigger, right? We have to have more systems to do data intensive computing. And this is not just a genomics problem. This is through lots and lots of different, um, lots of every, every field, um, I, I could argue, has, has a, a scale up issue. Um, it, innovation, so having access to clusters that can do use, analyze these big data sets, this is really what I'm all about, is that 1% you know, of the, the labs out there, the, the awesome labs to do all sorts of great stuff that, that I benefit from and everybody benefits from that, you know, the Broad Institutes and places like that are great. Um, but there's a lot of other labs out there and we need to be able to make sure that we have access um, for this, these compute systems. And again, I, I go all the way down to the high school level. If we can get that at the high school level and people can be learning how to do this, you know, before they even get to, they have an AP exam for it, like that would be awesome. Then people would be, you know, hitting the ground running in, in a, or maybe even not even going to college and starting their businesses and doing build, building our economy. Um, the big thing here, and this I was saying mentioned this earlier, is um, we have to have a place where we can run um, run compute uh, or workflows and have them fail, because if we're doing if we're having a ten percent success rate with our experiments, we are doing great, and that's awesome um, for moving forward with our our science. But a ninety percent uh, credit suck from Google 
is not great, that we could burn through credits and testing. And so we have to have a layer, um, like our campus cluster um, is too, for testing these things out before we move to the cloud. I think the cloud is absolutely going is absolutely critical for my work um, down the road, and I and I don't know how to ask for the amount of money I need to process the data yet. I'm still learning how to do that. Um, once you have a Kubernetes enabled workflow, it'll run on lots of different things, right? These are these are rationales for the, the PRP, and so for scaling up Nautilus, you know, a Nautilus is a cluster, right? And it's awesome. And thank you, Dima, and everybody that's on here. I can't see everybody um, for doing this. Um, building the system, just allowing me to, to learn how to, to test this out. The ways to build up is scavenging old nodes. So I've got through, through a collaboration, six nodes that I've got in my lab that I can distribute to people and add them to the cluster um, that, that's a UCSD um, permitting. <laughs> um, buy a new node. So we actually use the money we have from NSF to buy our Clemson uh, node here. So we're able to add a, a shiny new node to the cluster. Um, I think this is a really important thing here is that um, I hear a lot of talk about uh, funding models and things like that. Who's going to uh, keep these things grow going? Well, if if you have um, uh, these no, uh, if I could add nodes to a system, I could write that node into my grant, just like I do for campus cluster nodes right now. And so, if there's a place for me to put the node, then it's not that expensive to do it, right? A ten thousand dollar node that you know uh, John Graham has the list of all the parts for it, you know, gets you a lot and add to the, the cluster. So I think this is micro granting from faculty is a great way to grow out the cluster. Um, and I love it because it's it's across the uh, university lines, right? We're all sharing these resources and I think that's the way to go. Um, another thing with this is still, you know, issues that we're learning about allocation policies for this. So as we get more people on this, you know, we start conflicting, um, we need to have better allocation policies. Um, once we have, um, uh, the, my, my plan right now, and, I, and I've talked to uh, San Diego folks about this, is that we want to add, want to add some more nodes to, um, to Nautilus. And once we're, we, we're ready, once there's some ability to federate clusters, I want to pull out of Nautilus and make my own virtual organization node that I have to get money for and control that. I'm a user for plant genomics collaborators that I have and also um, for educational purposes. This is kind of my, my model right now. And so that allows me to like to, you know, to, I don't know, just have some control over the, the system, but still be a system that works across um, university boundaries. Um, and so we still have to do this, right? And inter Internet2 and, and UCSD and others are working on ab ab abilities to federate the clusters. And at the end of the day, if I can have my own virtual organization, um, and it'd be great if it like linked up to my campus cluster too, right? Or whatever resources are out there. But it's a way for me to um, to fund to get money for the that particular cluster that I can use um, for lots of people. So I'm gonna. Uh, oh, it's a, one one last thing. Well, I'll stop there and, and add, see if anybody has any questions. So while y'all are thinking of questions, I always have questions for Alex. Um, but first, I want to just thank you so much for doing the demo, because that just really makes it concrete for me, <laughs> what you're doing. Um, and I'm wondering, so these, so did, were there any, like, issues, what did you find when you were doing, you know, you've been running Kubernetes workflow on the PRP. Um, when you move that, you know, Kubernetes is supposed to be run it anywhere. Did you have any kind of things you had to change to run it on any other platforms? Um, yeah, I mean, there's always tweaks. Like when you, when you go into Google, right, there's some, some esoterica with like the GKE mm -hmm. and engine and things like that, but it's not that it's norm, normal kind of figuring, figuring out the technical problems. Right. So it's not perfect mapping. Um, but once you have some of those issues resolved, then it's easy to map it to different systems. So how does it compare to the pain that was any other porting you've ever done? I would say it's, it's uh, to, to equal or less. Yeah. I just give it equal for now. Cause I mean, getting on any system is hard. Yeah. Right. And, and this is, this is academic software too, right? So we're all always trying to, the software is broken. Right. We're trying to fix that while we're trying to make it fix, work on the system and all that. Yeah, if it all worked, they wouldn't call it research, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, and I, so I'll do one last question since we're near the end of time, but if someone else has one, feel free to chime in. Uh, oh, here's one. Here, thank you for the demo. 
Any comments on A, using S3, the API, not necessarily AWS, for the data storage instead of volumes? And B, WDL, workflow description language, towards a bit more comparability for genomic workflows, i.e. so everyone doesn't have to package VWA. Composability, sorry, okay. <laughs> Um, wait, that's right. What was the first question I already lost? I was thinking about the so, second one. Yeah, this is in the chat. If you want to unmute and ask yourself. Oh, yeah. I'll chime in here. Uh, Rob Curry from UCSC. Hey. Um, thank you for the demo. It looks great. Uh, just thoughts on using, we've kind of pushed a lot of grad students uh, kicking and screaming towards everything lives, lives on S3. No more shared file servers. Right. Um, kind of your thoughts on just that as the way to store stuff, I mean, separate from downloading it ephemerally locally. Uh, and then the second part of this question, somewhat related, is this whole effort of WDL, work, workflow description language, towards a little more composable genomics pipelines. You know, everybody and their uncle shouldn't have to repackage BWA. Yeah. So, all right, so S3, so we're, we are, that is definitely a, a way for us to be pulling data into our, our workflows. And we're working with that a little bit. There's some other priorities that we're addressing right now. Um, but a lot of the data we want to pull it is from, from NCBI. And I don't even know what that means anymore. A lot of it's probably in S3 buckets anyway, and I still don't even know, I haven't kept up with the times. But we definitely want to be able to do that. And as far as the workflow languages, so we chose next a big part of it, so it has Kubernetes support. Um, and we like it a lot because it's sort of like a bashy type you know, workflow manager. Um, and so I have no problem with anybody using any workflow manager. That just kind of worked for us. Um, but I do, I don't, I'm not a big fan of like trying to make a one workflow that will, that will work for everybody. Cause there's always so many exceptions that, you know, I feel like you need to have a, a level of being able to modify workflows, whatever, you know, manager or workflow language it's in. So, I mean, they're all, they're all good. They're all, I like diversity. They're all, all, all great, but I, I have no opinion on one better being ours being better than the other or next being better than the other. Excellent. Thanks. And you know, along those lines, too, we, you know, we had a Debs project. We developed the Galaxy workflows that run out of triple databases, right? So we're, 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 we uh, have worked on other, other things, too. Alex, uh, this is Bala from Rutgers, former Open Science Grid. How are you doing? Good, good. I have a question about data, so along the same line. Um, so in one of the diagram, you have shown data parts, um, so I'm wondering, like, is it a job? Uh, is the data persistent? Um, so is it part of the job or separate, like uh, you store the data and call that as a part? Uh, can you explain that? Yeah, so this, this is where like, okay, I, I, I'll do the best I can, but I might be wrong. Um, if actually, if, if Cole's on here, I think I saw my engineer on here. But so the, the, there's a persistent volume that we can store data on that's associated with our namespace, that deep GTEx. And so the data is persistent there, um, but we're pulling, we, uh, we have to pull data onto that so that we can process it. So we have to go through that, that layer to be able to get, get our data right now. And, oh, okay. exactly yeah. and then the IRODs, and then is it part of that or a separate one? That's still, we have, we, we have so many projects going on. Um, we haven't properly hooked that into our workflows yet, but that's, that's on the near term list of things. Okay, okay, yeah, thank you. Super. Are there any other last minute questions? Well, in that case, Alex, I just want to thank you so much. This was great. And I really want to thank you for like pushing the boundaries on all of this stuff. Um, seeing how much you can do and helping others do it too. Thank you. And thank you everybody on this call for all the resources that we're accessing, right? Because a lot of people are responsible for us to be able to do, do this demo. Thank you. I appreciate yep. it. Yep. Thanks, everyone. And um, again, if you have ideas for future speakers that you'd like me to go, you know, twist their arms for, just send me an email. Um, and with that, I think we'll We'll call it for the month and we will record and post on YouTube so you can share with all your friends. So, thanks everyone and we'll Thank see you. you in a month. <laughs>